evening. Hope everybody's having a good week. I don't know if Chris is in here. It was actually kind of funny when he said that. I was thinking, I was joking with my wife earlier that I might need to tell the song leader to lead some extra verses today, but apparently he was having a similar day to me. Um, I am a little sleep deprived, so if I just stopped talking for a second, it just means my brain quit working, so just bear with me. I'll get through it, I promise you. Nothing I haven't ever been through before. Um, prayer requests that I already am aware of. Um, Lauren Moore, of course, was mentioned tonight. That's Jackie Moore's daughter. Um, is having some, I would call it blood clotting issues um, from the text that I read. Uh, so keep her in your prayers. Um, a prayer of thankfulness for my cousin Bob Floyd. Um, Bob had a few episodes. I think the good Lord had to tap him on the shoulder three times in a day to make sure he went to the doctor. Um, but he had a 99% blockage, and he avoided a heart attack with a cast today. So we're really glad that happened, because it would have been really bad um, if he had not had that done. So he's recovering from a cast, so keep him in your prayers. Um, what else? Blair Chapman. Bad day in Memphis. Okay. Okay. Hello, man. Okay. I can remember my little brother Chris Fowler and his family. They're in the Hurricane Path. Okay. Chris Fowler is in Miami area. Oh, he's up. Well, he's south of Orlando. We're in the state of Texas, Miami. You're in the zone right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's a crazy, crazy storm. And all our for that night. Jonathan, Paul is really struggling right now. Paul. Yeah, Jim. Jim, they still in. They got three months. Y'all say a prayer for me. I got to drive to Tuscaloosa in the morning. Watch my catch on fire every time I go in there. Uh, Brian Denny is like half a mile. You can see it from where I have to go, too. So I always just, just hurts. Anyway. All right, let's go to our God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us, Lord. And You are the author of all creation. You're the Father of lights. And we thank you for the ability to come before you and pray and lay our, lay our request at your throne. Lord, we have several that have been mentioned here tonight, some that are sick, some that are recovering. And Lord, we pray that you'll be with each of them, Heavenly Father, in the way that they need most. We pray a thankfulness prayer for all the things that we pray, we have prayer requests for, and, and then those people get well, and oftentimes we forget to say thank you, Lord, and we say thank you for all of those things. Lord, we are mindful of the destruction that had happened uh, due to the hurricane last week, and we pray that you'll continue to be with those families. We know from past events that it's not over within a week just because the TV quits talking about it, and they'll have months to over a year worth of work to do from this. We pray that you'll be with each one of them, and we pray that you'll bless the works of the church uh, that's going on here. Uh, the mission trip going down there soon, Heavenly Father. Pray that you'll help that to be fruitful. Pray that you'll be with all those people that are fleeing from the storm. Uh, those that are already in the path, Lord, in the, in the Puerto Rico area, Lord. And we pray that you'll be with those in South Florida. And pray that as they evacuate, Lord, that it will be smooth and, and safe, Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray that you will help the storm to diminish in its scale, Lord. Its awesome power is astounding, Lord, as we look at it. And, Lord, we are remindful, Lord, that you put your bow in the clouds to keep from destroying this world with water. And it's your great and holy Son's name that we pray. Amen. All right. So last week, uh, we got to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we went over how Abraham's response to guest and Lot's response to guest were very similar. They both went out to meet. They both bowed before. They both prepared a meal. Abraham had a lot had help. Lot did not have that help. Uh, we mentioned the fact that he offered his two daughters to the crowd. They refused the two daughters. They wanted um, the men that had come to see him. They then tried to hurt Lot. Does Lot try to protect them? And then uh, Lot delays in fleeing, right? And so after he delays in fleeing, he uh, he wants to go to a city or a small village because it was small. Anybody remember the name of that town? Do what now? I think I heard it. So, speak with confidence. It's okay. If you're wrong, this will say no. Oh, 
but Zoar was the town that he wanted to get to. And we will find today that, or find tonight, we remember from the passage, his wife did not make it. She stopped and turned around and was turned to a pillar of salt. They continued on to the city of Zoar. They got to the city of Zoar, and they took refuge there. Uh, we're going to pick up in that story tonight, but I wanted to mention something that Uncle Milton mentioned to me, I think it was two weeks ago, and I meant to mention it last week and forgot, and I don't know what jarred my memory just now, but he was drawing a parallel, and I love it whenever people come up to me after class and share various things, because I learn a ton from you, um, I can assure you. But anyway, what he was saying was, he said, you know, he said, it's interesting to me that paradise is described as Abraham's bosom. And that's not something we typically think of. You know, we hear that it's described that way, but we just don't really take it into account. But what's interesting is, is we look at the account of how he entertained the Lord and how he was in a, in quick to take care of and serve the needs and take care of them, and that's how paradise is described. It's someone that is going to, a place where we're going to be taken care of without even asked to be taken care of, Right? And that's an amazing uh, an analogy that, that the scripture draws out, and, and I had never put those two together either, so I really appreciate Uncle Milton sharing that with me. And I wanted to share that with you, and then parallel that to Lot. Lot was very accommodating, was very hospitable, uh, obviously, to the angels, to the point of offering his two daughters. Uh, but he doesn't compare to Abraham, right? And he was only saved because God remembered Abraham. Now, there wasn't enough people in the city to save the city. In fact, if God had wanted to, he could have just lost ignored Lot altogether. But out of respect for Abraham, he decided to save Lot. The story tonight is almost, it's not as evil, I wouldn't say, but that's a terrible way of looking at it. About Lot with his daughters is probably one, in my, in my opinion, one of the most unique stories in all the Bible. And it's interesting because of the way the, the whole story goes down and what just happened and then the literal names of the children that are born from this group of scripture. So with no further ado, we're going to be in Genesis 19, verse 30. Genesis 19, verse 30. It says, now Lot went up out of Zoar. Okay, now wait a minute. He wanted to get there because he was going to be safe. And he got there, and as soon as he gets there, what does he do? He leaves. Now we don't know exactly why he left. It could be that he didn't like the city. It could be that you know, Sodom and Gomorrah are still burning. And he's like, you know what? Maybe I should go into that hill country like those angels told me to to begin with. We don't know, but he decides to leave. And he decides to leave Zoar. And at this point, depending on what your view is on how bad the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah are, there are plenty of people that attest that Sodom and Gomorrah are actually now at the bottom of the Dead Sea. Okay, there are some people that say that no, the sea was there, the land is destroyed, it's flat, it's, des it's deserted, whatever. doesn't matter. But the point of the matter is the destruction was to the point, the argument can be made, that there's no archaeological evidence of Sodom and Gomorrah anymore. They're gone. Okay? So, with that being said, he decides to leave Zoar. And he lives in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zoar. doesn't say why, but he was afraid to live there. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. There are caves around the Dead Sea that there has been evidence where they have found where people lived in that area, and it was oftentimes thought to be a place where people would seek refuge, would hide out. And so it's not an unusual thing for him to be here, but it's very important to realize this would be, at this time in history, a very desolate place. And so he is living in this cave with his two daughters. Apparently, he's not making an effort to get out of there. And if you think about it from Lot's perspective, Lot has had a bad couple of days here, right? Because he has lost his wife, he has possibly lost other children, other sons, and we know he's lost sons-in-laws, and he lost all that just a few days earlier. All the people that he knew, whether they were good or bad, they're all gone too. All of his possessions were gone or destroyed in this process. And so Lot is kind of doing what some people do when bad things happen. And that is they hunker down, they close themselves in, and they just don't go anywhere. It's actually a sign of severe depression. And Lot's just hunkered down. He is literally in a cave. He was one of the wealthiest men in Sodom. Remember his possessions. We talked about that several chapters ago. One of the wealthiest men in Sodom, and now he is hunkered down in a cave. And I don't know if he's afraid the people of Zoar and come after him because maybe they think that his God was the one that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Maybe he was afraid that God was like, okay, now that he's not there, I'm going to finish destroying Zoar. Who knows? But he's hunkered down in the cave. Verse 31 is where things get weird. It says, And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Is that a true statement? No. So what is she really getting at? There's no one close. Every person we knew is gone, right? That whole valley was destroyed, not just those cities. Remember that. And so from their perspective, these young women are at the point where they don't think there's a man left on earth that they can have children by. And having children was so important to them, they decided to do a very heinous act. What's interesting is, is immediately after the purge of the earth with the flood, Noah had an incident. Immediately after the purge of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot has a very similar incident. And it's amazing how much these two things sim- are, are how similar these are. But I want you to think of this totally from Lot's perspective. And I'm going to draw out some pictures here, and maybe they're pleasant, maybe they're not. There probably won't be. Uh, but we'll go on down through here. So verse 32, Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So their intent is, to keep their father's line going. Okay, that may be fine. But your method is not right. And I don't think anyone in this room would argue with that fact. The problem, though, is, is Lot allowed this to happen. And what I mean by that is, is he had a choice not to get so drunk as to do what's about to happen. The younger daughter had an opportunity to speak up, and she just remained silent from what we can see. She's just like, okay. And so, here we go, verse 33. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. In other words, he is drunk to the point he has passed out. He is out cold. He has no clue this happens. Now what's the next step? Well, verse 35 says, So they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. Now, your lot. You've had a bad few weeks, bad few days, however long it's been. Your daughters decide to get you drunk. Two nights in a row. You have no clue anything happened. A few weeks go by, you still have no clue what happened. Maybe a month goes by. Maybe two months go by. Maybe three months. But soon, somewhere in there around the five or six month mark, Lot's going, wait a minute. Y'all are pregnant, and there's no guy anywhere around here. Can you imagine that conversation with your father? Obviously, I can't, but I'm just saying. The name Moab means from father. That is the name of the child, from father. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. That is the reason this text is recorded, because the Moabites come into effect later on in the Bible. That's why we know about the Moabites. They came from Lot. He is the father of Moabites to this day, verse 38. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. And I may have said that wrong. That name means, let me look this up again, yeah, son of my people. Literally. Literally. So the two children's names were named basically from the fact of this child came from my father, this child came from my people. Those are the two names that were given. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. And that's where that story ends. Until we're introduced to the Moabites later on and Ammonites later on, that story ends. But it's a sad tale on Lot how much the tides have turned on Lot at this point in his life. You know, he was in, if you will, the bosom of Abraham for a long time. He made a really poor choice to go down to live in the Sodom area. Did not leave that area despite its wickedness. 
there's, a, there's probably a whole lesson in that right there. And then as that progressed, he's at the point where he's living in such solitude that his daughters get him so drunk, he fathers children with them. And he had to live with this for the rest of his life. And so going on from there, we're going to get into chapter 20. Chapter 20 is an amazing chapter to me because it doesn't seem to fit the narrative of the previous chapters we've been studying. And the reason I say that is, is we're going to rewind real quick. If we look back at chapter 17, or excuse me, yeah, chapter 17, God makes a covenant with Abraham. That's the covenant of circumcisions going on. And he says, I'm going to do this. You're going to be blameless in front of me. That's chapter 17. Flip over, we get into chapter 18. Chapter 18, the Lord appears to Mamre, appears, excuse, appears to Abraham at Mamre, and then the cowardly Abraham negotiates with God Almighty. Okay? This is a faithful person. When you're willing to be so bold that you negotiate with God Almighty, not to mention he's having conversations with God. Not dreams, not visions, conversations. Good bit of it, fairly routinely. Chapter 19, his nephew is saved. He's already been given a date at, Am at Mamre. It's going to happen within a year. Start the clock, and it's ticking down. And then chapter 20 drops in here, and to me it's one of those chapters where when you read this in the context of what's actually going on in Abraham's life, the clock has been started on when his promised child is coming and he pulls this stunt. And it's a warning to us as Christians how easily, when we're not focused on God, we can make very similar stupid mistakes. Because Abraham lost focus of what's going on. And I had never appreciated until this evening when I was studying this how close he came to messing up the whole promise. Because let's think through this. If Sarah is going to have a child, what has to happen to her because... She's been turned off, for lack of a better term, right? She no longer has the way of women with her. So her uterus has to be turned back on. Eggs that haven't flowed in years have to flow again. How long God chooses to do that could be a matter of weeks to a matter of months. I remember when I had to study that in pharmacy school, the rotations and the progesterones and the estrogens. It's a complicated cycle. All that had to be put back on, and God could have done it in a day. And you're like, where is he going with this? Abraham goofed up again with his wife. That's now been promised she's going to have a child this year. This year she's going she's to get pregnant. And here goes Abraham. From there Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she's my sister. Have we heard that before? What the world, Abraham? The woman is 89 years old. I mean, either she has a plastic surgeon that is amazing, or she hasn't aged in 40 years. Because kings don't pick old women. No offense to anybody that thinks of themselves as old. But since when have you ever seen a king pick a young woman? She's 89 years old. She's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Sarah was apparently an astounding woman. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man. That'll get your attention, right? You go to bed that night, you think all the well, you got this new hot 89-year-old woman living in the house with you. <laughs> And God says, you're a dead man. You're like, whoa, what did I do? You're a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Verse 4, now Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did, did he not himself say to me, she's my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Verse 6, then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Wait a minute, what? 
that implies some time has gone by. He's taken her as his wife, but that, that marriage has not been consummated yet. In other words, he has not touched her yet in any shape, form, or fashion. And God says, I'm the one that prevented that. That almost makes you think that like Abimelech tried and just had failure somehow. But he says, no, nope, I'm the one that did that. And he says an interesting thing here, that we, the first time that we see this, Therefore I did not let you touch her. Now then return the man's wife, for he is a prophet. Have we heard that word yet in Genesis? Nope. Abraham is the first prophet ever mentioned in the Bible. Now Melchizedek was the king, it was the most high priest of the most high God, but he was not called a prophet. And so Abraham says, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Now what's interesting here is God had removed the free choice of Abimelech up to this point. Because he said, I kept you from touching her. Now he's given Abimelech a choice. You want to touch her? Go ahead and try. And he says, Abraham is going to intercede for you. He's going to be the one that prays for you. Who does that sound like? Abraham is going to intercede on the behalf of him because of his sin. Who does that sound like? Sounds like Christ, right? Remember, this pattern has already been started multiple times with Abraham. And so he says, he's going to pray for you. Verse 8, Abimelech's response is, is what I call a classic. So Abimelech rose early in the morning. I would think so. Right? I probably wouldn't have gone back to sleep after that dream. You ever have one of those dreams so real you go check on your kids to make sure they're okay in bed? Okay. Rose early in the morning and called all of his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? This same word that's translated a great sin oftentimes means adultery. Now, that's an important word to remember because it makes Abraham look foolish in just a second. Let's keep going. You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? In other words, Abraham, you lied to me. You did the things that shouldn't be done to me, and that's not fair. Now, tell me why you did it. What did you see in my kingdom that just made you lie to me like this? And the reason I said Abraham's response makes him look foolish is the fact that the man, the king Abimelech, says a great sin. And, by the way, he listened to God. And we'll remember that when we read Abraham's response because that's a lesson for us and in in all of us in this building tonight. Abraham said in verse 11, I, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. What? What did Abraham say? Before that. You ever not talk to someone about God because you assume they wouldn't care? You ever just assume that they don't look the part, they don't act the part, they don't speak my language, whatever? If Abraham can be guilty of that, I guarantee anyone in this room can. And what reminds me what's interesting here is Abimelech has been told by God he's guilty of a sin that he was completely innocent of, of committing. My poor wife experienced this several years ago in a totally different way. What happened in her situation was a girl in the youth group who was, I guess you could say by youth group, that her mother attended and she did about twice to three times a year. If you can call that in the youth group. She hadn't been in church in weeks, if not months, and by the way, I taught the teenage class so I kind of knew her attendance record. 
We were at a game in Boonville, at a high school game in Boonville, and this girl, for all that we remember, basically walked about 10 to 12 bleachers below us. I was sitting there, and someone else that went to the church with us at the time was also sitting there. <coughs> there were no words, no conversation that occurred between the three to five of us and this young teenage girl that no longer attended church. A few weeks after this, didn't even think about it. In fact, we didn't even speak to her. She was that far away. A few weeks later, her mama walks Kim into a room and says, I haven't been able to look at you at church the last several weeks. Kim's like, I'm sorry? What'd I do? You told my girl that you thought she was wearing the wrong kind of clothes that game Friday night. Kim's like, I didn't talk to her. And if you don't believe me, Jonathan was there, and I won't call the other person's name. That person was there too. And their son was there, and their daughter was there. No conversation happened. You're telling my daughter's lying to me? Well, what did she say? Well, she said she's not coming back to church because of you. Kim just kept her mouth shut and went on about her business and apologized for something she hadn't done. The point I'm making here is the girl had not been in church for months. Apparently, Mama says, you need to go to church this Sunday, and for some reason, this girl plucks Kim out of a lineup and goes, it's her fault. And this mom is so ignorant to figure out, you haven't made her go to church in three months. How is this suddenly someone else's fault that happened two weeks ago? But see, we can be blind by stupid things, but Abimelech is being accused of something he really didn't do. And he's telling Abraham, I didn't do this. Why did you do this? Why did you accuse me of something I did? Why did you make this great sin on me? Abraham goes, I didn't think you were afraid of God. And I remember another guy that came to church one time, and I'll never will forget it, a fluorescent orange polyester suit. No lie. This was, in, this was when we were attending at Gloucester Street many, many years ago, and I was very active with that youth group. And... I got up to the class, and there was, not teenagers, sorry, there was a lot of snickering going on. And I picked up real quick, they're talking about the guy that showed up in the orange suit that was in the movie Dumb and Dumber. That's what he showed up in. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. But he's in this fluorescent orange suit, and you know, they're not being nice. Okay? And I lay into them. It doesn't matter what we wear. God doesn't look at what we wear. He looks at the heart, and I just preach to them. Two days later, WTVA News. Man's in prison for trying to hire somebody to kill his wife. But that wasn't the point I was making. The point I was making is, you don't judge a book by its cover. Now, this guy was a sinner. That happens, right? But we are guilty of that, and we know we are. So we can't be like that. We, can't, we have to empathize with Abraham to an extent, but at the same time, we have to learn from this story that we can't let our own prejudices cause us to assume things about other people. That's wrong. And Abraham's defense just doesn't hold water as soon as the man says, you brought this great sin on me. And then what we all do when we've told a little white lie, he tries to clarify the lie. Uh, besides, she, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. And you can almost see a baby like going, mm-hmm, Really? Really? And she became my wife. Verse 13. And when God calls me to wander from my father's house, uh oh, who do you just blame? That sounds like Adam, doesn't it? When God calls me to wander from my, from, from my house, I, I said to her, This is the kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, He is my brother. We only are aware of when it happened in Egypt and when it happened right here. But according to Abraham, he did this every time he went into a new town. Could you imagine being Sarah? He's my brother. Hope they don't try to take me as a wife. Every man that sees me wants to. 89 years old. And it, this went on, I mean, and you look at this, you look at Abraham, and you're like, Abraham, how'd you miss it? But all I say is go back to us, go back to us today. If Abraham can miss it, we can sure enough miss it, right? And the story goes on from here. Verse 14. 
Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham. Had Abraham done anything to earn this gift? Nope. Not at all. But Abimelech isn't taking any chances. God's done opened up the statement with, you're a dead man. And Abimelech's like, all right, I have made my peace with Abraham. He's got his wife back. Abraham's prayed for me. I'm going to go ahead and sweeten the pot. And he gives him male servants. He gives him female servants. He gives him more sheep. He gives him more oxen. And what's interesting is, is every time Abraham does anything, he gets more stuff. Y'all ever picked up on that? He lied to the, he lied to the Pharaoh. He walks out of Egypt with more stuff. All right? He lies to Abimelech. He walks out with more stuff. This is also, by the way, the same man that defeated five kings with a few hundred men, but is afraid of one king. And you look at that and it goes, that's so illogical. But once again, if it can happen to Abraham, it can happen to any of us. They give servants, female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. Verse 15 and Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. In other words, you just go and just take anything. You just, just have it. To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother. I love that phrase, by the way. I'm glad someone else laughed. I paused and I wasn't wanting to hear a nice concussion there. Behold, I have given your brother. I can almost hear him saying it to Sarah. Your brother. Brother. A thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone, you are vindicated. Why is that so important? That's true. This is not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> Bingo. They had to prove that Isaac was Abraham's child. That's the only reason we have chapter 20. And so when I go back to this, you'll hear me say this a time when I'm teaching class. God doesn't drop random pieces of scripture in the Bible for no reason. And I'd be willing to bet somebody somewhere, maybe 3,000 years ago, made an argument. Well, you know, Sarah shacked up with Abimelech for a little while there. Maybe that Isaac isn't Abraham's kid. Maybe this whole Bible is just a big farce. But this is a very public thing done in front of how many men? The men of the king's territory. And he does this in front of everybody. He says, you are innocent. He clears it. And that's the only reason I think we have chapter 20. is because otherwise, in theory, Abimelech could be Isaac's daddy. And that's kind of a problem, right? Kind of a problem. So, verse 17, Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech. We don't know exactly what was wrong with Abimelech, other than he was fixing to be a dead man. But he healed him. And this next part is what I find very interesting. And also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. We read this chapter, and it makes it sound like this was like one day. But apparently Sarah had lived there long enough that women had quit having children. Now once again, why is that an important historical marker in the, in the board? What? There was nobody pregnant in that time, and what does that say about King Abimelech? If none of his women were getting pregnant, what does it say about Abimelech? He wasn't fertile. God doubles down on it. One, Abimelech makes a very public gesture. This is your twist as a silver. You're innocent. Secondary, Abimelech had no children the entire time that Sarah was there. No women were having children. It is possible that Sarah was pregnant here. We, we, that's the one thing we don't have, is we don't know, we don't have a time stamp. Right? We know this occurred after Sodom. It's in the 12 months. 
if it didn't happen in the first three months, or really first two months, then Sarah gets pregnant somewhere in here. So this is a really big chapter. And we tend to just look at it and go, Abraham did it again. But this chapter is placed where it's at in Genesis for a very specific reason. And so the lessons tonight I want you to take home is, one, don't judge the book by the cover. Don't assume you know what someone's thinking about God. Right? Leave that up between God and that person. You do your part. Number two, I want you to remember that God will always carry out His plan regardless of how bad we mess it up. Okay? That's number two. And then number three, there's not a piece of Scripture wasted in the Bible. Sometimes we don't know why they're there, but they're always there for a purpose. Thank you so much. Have a great night and a great week. By the way, Isaac is born next week.